see everyone this evening this morning's in this morning's lesson the, the place we're getting at within the bible working our way to the bible we are in what is oftentimes called what's normally called the gospels of christ matthew mark luke and john and in, and in looking at that recognizing that word gospel we oftentimes will make the point that the word gospel means good news okay so really when you think about it my title doesn't make a whole lot of sense what makes the good news good news that doesn't make sense does it since that's what the word gospel means but i want to make that point we oftentimes will call it the gospel and we recognize we you know when when someone asks what does the word gospel mean well oftentimes i mean we're able to say it means good news but exactly why is it good news now the obvious answer is to say well because god is taking care of our sins and that gives us the opportunity to be with him for eternal life and that most certainly is true that's good news but what i want us to note this evening is what makes it what's the power behind what is the reason it is able to be good news and in doing that tonight by the way the, i mentioned that power behind romans chapter 1 verse 16 says i am not ashamed of the gospel of christ for it is the power of god unto salvation and so we recognize, of course, God gives it the power. But what makes it? How does it get its power? The involvement in the fact that there's power behind it. We need to keep in mind. And the things I'm going to be saying tonight are not something necessarily new to you. But I want us to be, I want us to be assured in our own minds about why, what gives God's gospel his good news that power because it's where that power comes from that is most important for us to recognize god being a christian is not a bunch of box filling and therefore when we get up to eternity uh, to judgment day god's going to sit there with a card out seeing if we filled in all the boxes and if we filled in all the boxes well i guess i gotta let you in type idea that's not what salvation is all about that's not how God works. Not trying to say that there aren't things necessary for us to do. Please don't get that idea in your mind. But it's not, has nothing to do with box filling, but exactly with God's power and what God expects. And so that is, that is what we're wanting to consider tonight. Two different points, and those two points are going to come from two different places that we see the gospel being described with initial salvation okay please understand something although we call the first four books the gospel of christ the entire new testament is the good news of god it really is it, it, uh, and, and i can show you another verse a verse in romans that shows that the continued preaching is part of the gospel of christ i don't want to take away from that but we do recognize an idea of the of the initial salvation go with me go with me for instance if you will so i can make my point as opposed to trying to do too much in introduction go with me if you will to first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 verses one and four if you were to ask most people People who are knowledgeable about God's word what the gospel of Jesus Christ is they would probably be able to uh, mention what's meant what's shown here although whether they could go to 1st Corinthians 15 or not many of them would be able to many of them would not but, but normally we're knowledgeable enough to understand what the good news is to recognize what it says in 1st Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 and the reason for that is 1st Corinthians 15 1 through 4 is a very small description of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, especially, I guess I should say, especially the end of them. All right. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Now I make to known to you, brethren, the gospel which 
I preached. There we go. I mentioned there the description of the gospel. He says, I'm talking to you about the gospel that I preach. Now he's going to mention what he preached to him. The gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and with which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which was preached to you, unless you believe. I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay, and then it goes on to mention He He was seen by He was seen by people. All right, it mentions uh, mentions some names and some numbers, but we'll stop right there. The idea that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried in the ground, and rose on the third day that in a nutshell, Paul is saying, is the gospel I preach to you. All right? The very fact that Jesus Christ accomplished what God sent him to do. All right? To die on the cross for our sins. And although being buried in the ground, to raise again on the third day, that's where the gospel gets its power. Never forget that fact. That although there are certain things that God's word speaks to us about that we need to do in order to be saved, those things that we do in order to be saved could never get us to eternity with God ever without what Jesus Christ did. That's where God's power comes from. It had to happen. And we discussed, we discussed that the reason why it had to happen this morning, the fact that death needed to occur. Well, Jesus Christ gave his life, died on the cross, that we might be able to have salvation. And so first and foremost, you know, and I am guilty of this. I have, I have basically changed the way I tend to, to speak with someone about God's Word, unless I already know that they have a certain background, that they understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross is why they're able to be saved. But way too often in the past, I have gone and studied with people about what they must do in order to be saved, and almost making it feel like I was telling them it's what you're doing that saves you and it's not what you're doing that saves you what you're doing is important towards your salvation no doubt about that but it's what Jesus did that saves us Jesus Christ died on the cross that's where the power comes from okay his blood his sacrifice his willingness to do that so in that idea I want us to know God didn't have to do that. I used a, a form of the word save, salvage. All right? We think of salvage, it's kind of like when there's a shipwreck and you're trying to salvage the ship, trying to get the ship back into a serviceable order to be able to use once again. All right? I, know, I know we don't normally think of ourselves as something that needs to be, if you think about it, we need to be salvaged. <laughs> we kind of ruined ourselves, didn't we? And God, God really does, when he, when he brings us back in, into his service, he salvaged us, he brought us back from the, where we messed up our lives. But you know, God didn't have to do that. You realize that there was nothing from the creation of mankind that God had to decide, had to decide, I'm going to save them. Nothing there whatsoever. In disobedience to God, like, like God was like Adam and Eve did in the garden, and each one of us has did since that, that time period, God has had the perfect right to decide, that's it, I'm done with you. In fact, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 7, turn there with me if you will. Genesis 6, 5 through 7, when we read those verses, God doesn't suddenly come up with something bad to do, something wicked to do, or he didn't decide, I think I might do it, and then go, no, that wouldn't be the right thing to do. No, look at what God does in chapter 6 of Genesis, giving the attitude of mankind at the time, God very nearly decided that that's it, I'm done, and balled it all up and threw it in the wastebasket called mankind. 
Look at what he says there in verses 5 through 7. Then God saw that the wickedness of man was great on earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. <laughs> from man to animals to creeping things and the birds of the sky for I am sorry that I have made him made them now if the Bible would have stopped right there <laughs> I guess the Bible would have stopped right there there wouldn't have been anything else to write would there but the very next verse gives us hope gave us hope uh, well, it gave the world hope because we now are, are taking the blessing of it. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God, it sounds like, was all ready to just ball it up and throw it in the trash can. His creation of mankind. And yet that's not what he did. Instead, what God did was he found a way to bring it about that mankind would actually continue through Noah. We oftentimes all joke about or not joke about, make the point that we're all related. We're all related through Adam. Well, in all reality, if you think about it, it goes a little bit closer than that. We're all related through Noah. No matter, it doesn't matter about Adam now, because every one of us are a descendant of Noah, because the rest of the world was destroyed. And God showed that he had the ability to destroy it. And if God had wanted, he could have destroyed it all, Noah included, because he had created it. But God, so God didn't have to salvage it, but it was his willingness that made the gospel good news. That God is even willing to do something with us after what we have done in sinning in the first place. But it's not only that. He didn't have to put up with us. Now God has saved the world. God saved the world through Noah, and then the world started growing, the population started growing again to the point that God chose a people through Abraham. And those people became a great nation through Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. Those people, or Isaac and Jacob, those people became a great nation called the Israelites, and then God leading them to the promised land gets finished that up again. Notice this. It makes me kind of wonder. I wonder, you know, when the Bible reports about like three or four other times besides Noah, where God almost went, that's it, I'm done. With the Israelites at least. One of those places in Numbers chapter 14. Go to Numbers chapter 14. Look at 11 and, and 12 of chapter 14 of the book of Numbers. And let me give you a little bit of background. The spies have come back, gave a report about the promised land. God had told them, I'm going to give it to you. And 10 of those five says, hmm, they're too big. We can't take them. We'll get destroyed. Why? And, and look at look at what they say. And, you know, two of the spies try to say, yes, with God's help, we can do it. But the people started believing the 10 spies. And look at what they said to, to Moses in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14. Then all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Now that last phrase is basically their epitaph, isn't it? Because God said, Okay, you're going to die in the wilderness. It was going to be worse than it was. Look at what's said down in verses 11 and 12 by God. The Lord said to Moses, How long will this people spurn me, and how long will they not believe in me? Despite all the signs that I have performed in their midst, I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them. Then I will make you into a, a nation greater and greater, greater and mightier than they. You know, God was just upset. He was fed up with them. And, they, and he was going to destroy them. And by the way, for you and I, just to look back with 2020 hindsight and say, I can't believe how they were. Um, I can look into my past and kind of believe how they were. Can you look into your past and kind of believe how they were? It's real easy for us to point into someone else's backyard and say, you should fix that. And way too often there's things in our backyard that fortunately got fixed 
And, uh, and we, we were just as bad, I truly believe, as those Israelites were. How many times we have written down how many times, a number of times, that God made that decision about the Israelites. I wonder how many of those times God had almost made the decision about us. Each one of us. See, God didn't have to put up with us. God didn't have to put up with our mistakes. Doesn't have to put up with our mistakes. But we come to find out that God truly does care about getting us into eternity with Him, doesn't He? And so what makes it, what makes the gospel good news? The good news is God didn't just wipe us out. That's good news. He could have done it. He didn't have to put up with it. But God, out of his own love for us, put up with it. Thirdly, he didn't have to buy us back. Now understand something. When God, when God stated that for sin, the penalty is death, when God stated that, that was a fact. That was what had to happen. I've heard some people say that God could have saved us any way he wanted to, um, but he just chose to do it by, by sacrificing his own son. I had a preacher one time who had heard, heard that statement made, and, and that, just, that just upset him to no, no end. What you're making God out is to be some kind of sadistic individual who, who, who made that own decision. That decision to send his son to die on the cross was a, was a sacrifice on his part. He didn't do it because, well, let me, let me show them how wrong this is. What can I do to make them show how bad sin is to me? I know I'll sacrifice my son. No, he sacrificed his son because there needed to be death to pay for it because that is exactly what he told Adam and Eve in the beginning. On that day, there will be death. You, you eat of that tree, there will be death. And there was death. They died spiritually, and that death had to be paid for. Jesus Christ suffered his death, not because God came up with some kind of cruel way of treating his son, but because it needed to occur for God's to be kept holy. He decided, I mean, he, he, he made it clear, whether it was decide, he made it clear that that, that had to happen for, that, for us to be saved. And so Jesus had to die, or we had to die, one or the other. And when you look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28, turn there with me real quick. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Paul talking to the elders from Ephesus in that verse. He's trying to make it clear to them the import, the, uh, the uh, position that they're in over God's people. And look what he says to them in verse 28. He says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. Now, there he's making it clear. You have a responsibility to look after, to take care of, to feed, to water, to, to, to spirit to look after the spiritual needs of the church of God. And look how important the church of God is to God. Look at what he says now. Which he purchased with his own blood. Now think about that for a few moments. This verse, by the way, tells us a couple of things. Whose blood was it he purchased us with? He says God's blood. Well, okay, yeah, Jesus is God, but he's almost making it sound like it was the Father. Understand something. This is, this is a concept that Jesus Christ was pointing out just before he died on the cross. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, if you've killed Jesus, if it was his blood that was shed for you, whose blood was it? It was God's blood. God, Jesus is God. And so when, when Paul is pointing out to those Ephesian elders here that, that some a death had to occur, it's oftentimes real easy for us to, to notice. And by the way, rightfully so, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's obviously talking about the father. He gave his son. And we oftentimes look at how difficult that would be for us to give our, our child for a bunch of sinners. That'd be a hard thing to do, wouldn't it? Don't know that I'd be willing to do that. But it's even, even more than that we need to recognize when we recognize that the Father and the Son are one. So it's just like the Father dying on the cross for our sins. God giving his blood for us. It was God. Jesus is God. And they are one. And God sacrificed us. So do you recognize what you're act we're actually saying when we say that? I think I mentioned that maybe at some point in time not too long ago. 
the one who was sinned against is the one who is paying for the sin. That just don't seem right. And yet God's word is showing us his willingness to make the gospel truly good news. Is that although I'm the one who deserved the punishment, God himself took it upon himself, that punishment that I deserve. Okay, so, so he didn't have to buy us back, and he bought us back with the blood of Jesus Christ, with the blood of God paid for our sins. Peter mentions it in the first, is it first? Yeah, first Peter. Peter mentions it in first Peter that we were bought back with the precious blood, not of silver and gold, but the precious blood of God's son is what we were purchased back with. Fourthly, and lastly under this point, he didn't have to take our punishment. Okay, kind of going along with the last point. But look what it says in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. Just kind of nailed the, the point before down with a sledgehammer here. Look at what, look at what God, God uh, kind of, <clears throat> through the Apostle Paul, he's, the Holy Spirit uh, inspires the Apostle Paul to kind of give God's view of what occurred when his son died for us. Here's God's personal opinion, his view of what occurred. Look at what it says in verses 6 to 11. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Uh, ungodly? That's you and me. Uh, and he gets more specific. Look what he goes on to say. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. You might think to die for someone who's worthwhile. That's what he's saying there. Some, some, you know, it's 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 a it's a iffy statement. You know, that person's worthwhile. I guess it's worth giving my life for. That's kind of what God through Paul is saying here. Look at the next verse. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're the ungodly. It's not like God sitting there and saying, you know what, those people, they are so worthwhile, I think I'm going to go ahead and send my son to die on the cross for them. That's not how God views it. And don't get me wrong about this. Although God is very blunt about what he did by sending his son to die for us. He's very blunt about it. Understand something, this is just how much God loves us. And, you know, a parent, for instance, will love a child no matter what that child does. A child can get pretty, pretty far off base. And if there's anyone in the world that's going to care for that child, it's going to be the parent. Okay? And that's how God sees us. We are his creation. We are his children. Through, through his creation of Adam, we are, we are connected to God. And God does, does have love for us. But, I, but in saying that love right there, like a very blunt parent will oftentimes do with their children, God doesn't hold back any, pull back any punches, does he? He says, this is really what you were that I did this. And so he says, while we, we were ungodly, the person won't, will, 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 might do it for a righteous man, might do it for a God, good man, but a person will not send someone normally for an ungodly man. Well, that's what God did. God sent his son to die for the ungodly. And in doing that, God took the punishment. And so what makes the good news good, uh, what makes the gospel good news is that God was willing to do it. When he, quite frankly, there was nothing, in, no, no darkness, there was nothing that would be evil in God not doing it. He didn't have to, but he did. And so oftentimes we will, uh, well, let me just point to myself on this one. Oftentimes I will not remember that. I will just because almost take it for granted that that's just how God is and he takes care of it without recognizing exactly what it means. That's just how God is. He is that good.
people will oftentimes, especially when God is requiring of them to get rid of something that they really like to do, or God, yeah, God, God is God is not budging on an issue or budging on uh, uh, on on taking care of uh, something that they will sit there and wonder how, wonder exactly why is God so, such a meanie, kind of like a little child when they when they can't have the cookie before they eat breakfast before they eat lunch, and you know you're a big meanie, and that's kind of how we oftentimes if we're if we, you know especially people in the world, but sometimes sadly in the Lord's church, where we'll we'll act like a little child, petulant little child, you big meanie. And exactly, it's just the opposite. It's God being as kind, as more kind than, than no doubt some of us, many of us, maybe all of us would be if we were in his place. Instead of getting fed up and giving up, continuing on and on until finally gets through to some of us and we come into eternity with him. So that's what makes the gospel good news, is God making it so. Secondly, God's acceptance makes it so. Now, what do I mean by that? Acceptance of what? Go with me to Acts chapter 8. This is the other place that I like to go to. And by the way, this is one of those good places to go to, to show people that there's more to the gospel as far as salvation is concerned than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this question, in fact. In fact, this is a question, and it's a good question. This is a good question that those in the world who don't even believe in the Bible will ask from time to time. And it truly is. And I, well, the reason I say it's a good question is it's one that we need to consider. Because it does say something when you realize what the answer is. And here's the question. What does the death of a man 2,000 years ago have to do with my salvation? You know what? That's a good question. Normally, if you're like me, we'll sit there and go, you just don't understand. You're not even thinking. And, and, so, and up, until, up until a certain time, not too, not, not, you know, in my lifetime, I was the one who wasn't thinking. That's a good point. What does it have to do with my salvation? Well, we already studied the first part of what it had to do. God wants us back. But the second half of what it does speaks about how the gospel is more than just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because who did Jesus Christ die for? Everyone. The whole world. Now and forever. Those who have lived past us, those who are not even born yet, before and until Jesus Christ comes, God died for everyone. So everyone's saved. Well, no, everyone's not saved, but God died for everyone. See, to say the good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross and was buried, was buried and rose on the third day isn't finishing the point. Because Jesus Christ did that, but not everyone is saved. And so what this says is that God accepts something from us that other people must not be doing or else they would be saved. You, you see the point I'm trying to make? There must be more to the gospel than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We just can't stop there. What else is there? Well, that's why I like Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, in verses 26 to 39, we have the entire account of the Ethiopian eunuch, the saving of the, the, the Ethiopian eunuch becoming a Christian. And in this account, I'm not going to read the entire account, but there is a couple things I need to point out. In this account, Philip goes up, the Holy Spirit sends Philip up to the chariot that the Ethiopian eunuch is in to talk with him. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading from the book of Isaiah. You see that in verses 32 and 32 and 33. He's reading from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 and 8, and the, and the verses around that, no doubt. But he's at that point reading those verses. Philip sees him reading it and asks him, do you know what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? The Ethiopian eunuch didn't. He said, I, I need help with this. How can I unless someone explains it to me? He, he didn't, he wasn't able to, he felt. And so look at what it says that Philip did in verse 35. Then Philip 
began, I'm sorry, then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard, and that's not a very good translation of that verse. The English Standard and the NIV do a great job. If you've got either one of those, you've got a very good translation of what is being said there. What's being said there is, let me read it, let me read it the way the Greek is, is saying it. But, you know, I'll read the rest of it just like it is here. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he preached the good news about Jesus Christ to him. In other words, like I said earlier, when we went to 1 Corinthians, um, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Paul said, this is, the, this is the good news that I preached to you, and he mentioned the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we understand from that 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 is part of the good news of God, the power of God unto salvation. Well, here he's saying, he beginning that scripture, he preached the good news about Jesus to him. So I can tell you for certain from what Paul said, at least some of what the Ethiopian eunuch was taught, he was taught the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you look at the verses in Isaiah, it's talking about the fact that Jesus Christ was led as a lamb to the slaughter there in verse 50, 32. Okay? And, he, and, and uh, so, so he's obviously starting there with the fact that this lamb, the lamb to the slaughter, what else? Jesus Christ. And he died on the cross, and he was buried for three days, and he rose from the dead, and that's good news. Why was it good news? Okay, the Ethiopian youth needed to know what that did for him. What I saved your soul, it saves your soul from sin. It does. How? Or am I saved then? Well, look what the Ethiopian eunuch does after the good news is taught to him. Verse 36, as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, why are you talking about baptism? I'm talking to you about the good news of Jesus Christ. No, no, my translation doesn't say that either. I may have a funky translation on that one, on that preach Jesus to him, but the rest of my translation is pretty good, actually. How did the Ethiopian eunuch know he needed to be baptized? Because he preached the good news to the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip did. And in preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, that it isn't good news unless I have a way of taking advantage of accessing what Jesus Christ did. It takes me being able to access it to make a man dying 2,000 years ago good news for me. And so the good news is God has set up a plan that works for you to follow it and to be able to have your sins forgiven. In other words, God's acceptance of what he gives us to do makes it good news. So we see it's what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and most certainly that is where it gets its power. There's no way that I can do anything. Well, what am I doing? I'm, I'm getting into my, my points. What we do is not enough to be saved. When you look at uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 10, God is very blunt in, in Luke chapter 17, verse 10. Jesus Christ tells us exactly what good what we do is in the service of God. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 17, verse 10. Luke 17, 10. He's, uh, he, just, he just told, uh, he just uh, is telling about having faith as a mustard seed. Uh, how, and then he goes in talking about having a slave who's doing these work for you, this work for you. He gets down to make his point in verse 10. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded you, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. What does Jesus mean by that? Well, man is created to be a servant of God. And so when we've done everything we possibly can, God hasn't profited anything. Why? Because he already owned that. 
He already owned us. He already owns the work that we have done for him. And Jesus Christ tells it with that parable because he says, <laughs> after a slave come, uh, comes in from the field, does the master say, hey, sit, kick up your feet, don't worry about it. No, the master says, now take care of my food, take care of me. Because that's what a servant's responsibility is, is to take care of the master. And so Jesus Christ makes it clear in verse 10, when you've done everything you, uh, you have done, you need to recognize you're merely a servant, and that's what you're supposed to be doing for God. You are unprofitable. God gained nothing from you. He can gain nothing from you. He already owns you and everything you could do anyway. So when we do, even if we were to follow, even when we follow God's gospel, it can't save us. What we do without the power of what God and what Jesus did on the cross, it can't save us. In fact, <laughs> Isaiah even says it more bluntly. He says, your righteousness is merely filthy rags. You know, he's saying, well, why, are, why is my righteousness filthy rags? Well, I made it filthy <laughs> because of my sins. My sin, my garment is, is dirty even when I do all the good that I possibly can do. Why? Because I dirtied it with some of the, with the bad that I did do. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away that filth in my life. There's no way I can do enough good in order to be able to save myself. And so what that means is, is that God, what, what we do, what we do is not enough, but what God requires of us is really not too hard. Why is that? Once we drop our attitude, it's easy to accept what God has to give us. Look at Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. Man, I had that air conditioner on earlier, and that, it must have gone back up again. I am burning up here. I see other people. You check that and see if that's if, where that thing is set. Honey, thank you. Isaiah chapter 55. Look at what God says here about what, about what we think as compared to what he thinks. Verses 8 through 9. For your thoughts, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. See, we will oftentimes get pretty caught up in what we are able to do or what we think is right, and we will, we will oftentimes, perhaps even to a certain extent, tell, be telling God, this is how you ought to handle things. And God says, no, you need to have an attitude adjustment. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Let me make it clear to you about what truly is the way things are done here. And for, and for us, we need to recognize that it doesn't matter what we think is good enough, what we think is going to be able to please God. God sets the bar for what he wants. So once we get rid of our attitude, what God expects of us is really isn't too hard. Once we realize exactly where we are, and once we realize that God has stacked the deck for our salvation. God has, from the very beginning of time, as we've been going through our study on the Bible, from the very, be very beginning of time, God has been working towards saving us. And in working towards saving us, God has even, as I said, stacked the deck by telling us in Matthew chapter 7, some verses I love to use all the time, but I want to I show them in their context. Verses 7 and 8, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock on the door, will it be open for you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be open. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or when he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Will he? Will he? If you then, being evil, know how to take give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? In other words, God wants us to have salvation. He stacks the deck to help us get salvation. The only thing He won't do is to make us accept salvation. 
But once we get past the point of, I got to depend on me and start depending on God, when we recognize how God is wanting to save us, and we realize that God is ready to accept us if we will just do his will, really what God has set up isn't too hard. He has his way of salvation for us figured out. And when we do, what ends up happening is God has us begin doing what we should have done from the very beginning in the first place. That's a very awkward sentence I put up there, but I wanted to get all that in there. The idea that what God wants out of us is what he created for us. He's been waiting for us to repent from our sins, which means to change our attitude into one of following him. Exactly what he created us to be. Adam and Eve in the garden, obedient to him. Or as, or as uh, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, when all is said and done, when all is, at the end of the matter is this, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is what man's all about. This is a whole of man. That's what God created us for. But we got away from doing that. And so God is just waiting for that to happen. And it's what he expects. In Matthew chapter 7, this is where I'm finishing the lesson. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. God tells us exactly what is going to give us entrance into eternity with him one day. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who has done, who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. What does God end up wanting from us? As I said a few moments ago, exactly what he expected of us in the beginning, to be his servants, to follow him. And God accepts our, God accepts our obedience to him with what his son did on the cross because of our sins. Those two things tied together are what causes us to be in eternity with him. It's not us saving ourselves but it's us aligning back up with God with where we were supposed to be in the beginning. And God uses that towards our salvation. That makes the gospel truly good news. It is good news. Too often times we miss the fact of just exactly how good that news is. God is willing and is bending over backwards in order to save us. And we need to be willing to move Move back towards him. The lesson this evening has been exactly that, to, to, to remind ourselves of exactly of what God has done. He's done what we don't deserve, but he's done it anyway. It shows his great love for us from the very beginning of time, and we need to be willing to love him back. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Because he, Jesus loved us, kept his Father's commandments, and came to die on the cross for our sins. If you're not a Christian today, you have the opportunity to become one. That's the only thing keeping you from being part of God's kingdom, part of God's promise, being in eternity with God one day, is your unwillingness to make that step. But if you are a Christian, you're saying you have noticed that there are things in your life you need to get right. God is still waiting for you to come back to him as well. If there's any way at all that we can help you to see, let us know what you're saying to say.